Hello and welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Libera with Touch the Sky. Now on today's show I'm going to be talking about sky networks, hence the choice of music, and this sounds a little bit like um, kind of Skynet is the first thing that comes into my mind thinking about Terminator, but this is completely different. Uh, I'm thinking about social networks of animals that are in the sky, in this case vultures. And vultures are one of my favorite groups of birds, if not my favorite of all time, um, which I know sounds a bit weird because they tend to get kind of a bad rap for being carrion eaters, for being kind of menacing looking, but they're actually really interesting birds and I think they perform a really valuable ecosystem function because they're out there cleaning up the stuff that might otherwise just be left out in the environment. And so it's quite interesting to read papers about them when they come out, and there are some research groups that focus on vultures. And in fact, one of the biggest things to look at in these guys is how they kind of utilize space and figure out where food can be found, and then how that information might be passed on from one bird to another. And this has been studied in the context of just social relationships in general, uh, also in terms of kind of the thermodynamics associated with getting up on um, the drafts of air that allow them to soar around. People have also studied their sensory capacities and how it is that they're able to see and smell these things. Um, a, a really interesting way to apply this kind of work is to look at how you can use weather patterns and vulture use of those different temperature gradients and, and thermals to predict where the animals are going to be so that you can make sure that pilots are avoiding areas where they might accidentally run into these guys and, and kill the birds but also put the pilots and the, the aircraft at risk. So there are all sorts of studies that have been done on these guys, but the one that I want to talk about today is quite a new one. Uh, as you know, I tend to like to try to find brand new studies that have just come out. And this is one where the researchers have looked at um, kind of different potential scenarios for how the vultures might be able to communicate with each other about the presence of potential food and then use each other's cues in order to cue in on that site of, of where they can go eat and then to kind of drop down out of the sky and go to that. And this is an interesting thing because uh, it's kind of, it's not so much focusing on the birds themselves, you know, calling to each other and actively signaling because they want to share this information. Instead it's thinking about how their behavior might be kind of inadvertently allowing other birds to uh, follow in their footsteps and, and maybe beat them to the punch sometimes, maybe uh, put them in kind of uncomfortable circumstances because suddenly everyone's going for the very same thing. So it's kind of about these uh, unavoidable cues that we give to other animals around us when we happen to behave in the way that's best for us. So it's using, using vultures as a cue of that. And this is quite an interesting area of research in general. Um, because really what I'm talking about is socially acquired information. And this is information that is used in lots of different species. So it's not just animals, uh, so things like vultures and, and humans, for example, but also things like plants and bacteria. We see it throughout the natural world. And these are types of information that can be used in lots of different ways. So for example, in figuring out how to move through or select habitat, and figuring out how best to make mating choices and when to commence breeding and how to do breeding activities. Also thinking about foraging and, and finding of food and using food. So there are lots of different kind of um, life history traits and categories in which social information could be quite an important thing. Now social information can also drive population dynamics because it's impacting each individual species, but or sorry, each individual uh, animal of a species, but it's also potentially impacting those animals in quite long-term ways. So if this is impacting where you're going to choose habitat or how much nutrition you get because it's your foraging habits, then of course that can go on to determine how long you live or who you're breeding with and how you're able to breed, how many offspring you produce. And so those can have large implications for the rest of a population. And because populations are quite important uh, levels on which to think about kind of the overall species dynamics, this can also have a real impact on whether a whole species is doing well or is not doing well, because where one bird is impacted and one big group is impacted, suddenly the rest might follow as well. And so it's really important to kind of understand how this information can be used and to think about 
To what extent do animals use personal information or information that they pick up on their own by looking around in the habitat and experiencing things on their own? And to what extent do they use social information? And how, you know, what What's the kind of the relative proportion of using one of those versus another? And of course, we know that this is not going to be true. Uh, whatever the ratio is, it's not going to be applicable to every single species. It's going to probably differ from one species to the next and be quite different. And so you would have to study this again and again in these different organisms in order to know how they're interacting with their environment and using this kind of information. And we know that this is actually quite useful when you're thinking about collective animal behavior. So. For example, thinking about how fish school in the water and how birds flock together. When you think about uh, starlings doing those amazing huge flocks where they kind of are flowing around and it looks like they're all completely coordinated and, and no one really yet has quite figured out how and why this can happen. But social information is quite important because they're obviously queuing in on tiny little adjustments that their neighbors are making and so as a result the tiny little adjustments that each individual makes then kind of uh, have an effect, a knock-on effect, a cascade through the rest of the flock to allow them to coordinate in this way. Also we know that this is how a lot of animals can achieve breeding synchrony and also plants as well to make sure that they're all breeding at the same time, hopefully the right time, uh, because that whenever you kind of b breed collectively that means that you're going to increase the chances of the survival of young, because if you have a lot of young produced at once, then no matter how many predators there are, you kind of collectively got uh, a better chance of having some surviving young because you've got others in there that can be picked off by the predators, which would increase the chances that, that some of them will survive. Also, vigilance is quite important. So if you've got more eyes looking out for potential predators or other threats, then it's going to increase your chances of survival and make things more useful. And so if you can um, if you can watch your neighbor and see if your neighbor is looking a bit wary of something, then you can use that information to know that maybe you should be wary as well. So we're still learning about social information even though we know that it is useful in contexts like this. And in particular, we're still trying to figure out which different forms of information are used, both kind of in general but also in specific instances with specific species. We're also thinking about how it's used in the real world. So when do animals use it? Why are they using it? What's the outcome of using it? What would happen if they, um, if it were available but they chose not to use it or they couldn't use it for some reason? So just trying to kind of contextualize it and get a better understanding of it in a biological context. And to date there have been some people that have done empirical work on this, so they've gone out into the field and watched animals, they've done experiments to try to test certain hypotheses, and there also has been some theoretical work where uh, generally they've kind of been able to program certain parameters into a computer to say if all animals behave like this, what would happen, how about if they did this, what if we had half doing this and half doing this, what would be the outcome, so trying to figure out kind of the implications of certain types of behaviors and then maybe entering in some, par some parameters that have been seen in the wild to then figure out how close uh, do these kind of theoretical models match what we've actually seen out in the wilderness. And the current study that I want to talk about today is actually one that does a little bit of both of these things and that's really kind of the power of theory is being able to come up with a, a hypothesis that you want to test and come up with what you think you would find if your hypothesis is true and then testing that against what we actually see in the natural world to see how closely those things align. So theoretical work can give you the hypotheses that you want to test and it can give you the means to go out and test those and that's quite a powerful thing to be able to do. And um, these guys have looked at vultures, obviously I've already mentioned that, uh, to look at how they find their carrion resources and how this ability to, for an individual to find something and for other individuals to then see what each animal is doing, how that impacts the utilization of carcasses that are out in the wild. And they tend to do this also in quite a short period of time, so it's thinking about how is it that they use this information, if in fact they do, and how quickly are they all responding and how does this impact their ability to make use of the largest amount of potential resources out there and how does it affect how quickly that all happens. And basically what they did was came up with three different hypotheses and they modeled these hypotheses based on the use of 
social and private information by foraging vultures. So they had three different scenarios that they were testing. And they put the parameters into the computer to generate what they, you know, kind of thought would happen if each one of these hypotheses was uh, actually what's going on in the field. And then they went out into the field and collected data to see which one of those three hypotheses was the closest to what they were actually finding out in the wild. And they, um, they were using sheep carcasses, and I'll talk a little bit more about this after the break, but they were using sheep carcasses to actually create that habitat so that they knew where the vultures were going to be and they could kind of sit there and wait for them to come in so that they knew exactly how and where to collect these data. So let's think a little bit more about vultures so you can kind of contextualize that a bit and, and think of how the study worked and why it's kind of interesting. So vultures do uh, something that's called obligate scavenging, which means that they pretty much only are eating carrion. They're only eating stuff that is found dead already out in the wild. And this is interesting because among vertebrates there is quite a lot of opportunistic scavenging, which means that you've got animals that if they walk across you know, the habitat and they happen to stumble across a, a dead animal, they say, okay, that's pretty good use of uh, you know, my time and my energy to just eat that since it's right there and it's not really going to be hard for me uh, to kind of get that extra energy. But there are other animals that uh, actually have to go out and can only rely on this sort of thing. We have lots in the aquatic habitats, for example. We know that there are a lot of, of fungi and bacteria as well, thinking about other taxa that focus on eating only things that are already dead. And vultures are uh, really the only obligate carrion consumers among vertebrates. And there are 23 extant species of vultures around the world that engage in this behavior. And they possess morphological, physiological, and behavioral specializations that allow them to find and feed on the dead animal. So for example, they have a particular beak shape that allows them to break into carcasses. Some of them have larger, more powerful beaks than others, so they're particularly good at doing this. Uh, they, have, they tend to have mostly naked heads so that they can stick their heads into the carcasses without getting lots of gunk all in their feathers and then carrying that around and potentially making themselves uh, susceptible to disease. Their physiological adaptations include things like being able to fast for long periods of time and then gorge whenever they do find a carrion resource and then kind of to be able to sit and metabolize that and then use that for quite a long time while they search for something else again. And of course we know that they're able to do things like soar incredibly high in the sky and some of them are able to sniff out rotting meat. Others are able to see extremely well and so they have these adaptations that allow them to find from a great distance and a great height these sources out in the habitat and then key in on exactly where they are and find them in the landscape and then eat them as soon as possible. And carcasses are a resource that's kind of an interesting resource because they're difficult to locate in space and time so you, you can't ever really predict exactly where there's going to be a carcass or when there's going to be a carcass. Now there are some really large-scale events where uh, the animals do kind of learn that they can go to a certain place at a certain time and capitalize. Like for example, up in Alaska when you've got the salmon runs, you'll often find a bunch of bald eagles and bears and things like that that will kind of aggregate at the rivers where they know these salmon are going to die after they spawn and also while they're trying to make the journey. So there are some really big migratory things like that that animals can take um, advantage of, but for the most part you know, if you're just thinking about kind of everyday life, you never really know when an animal's just going to kind of keel over for whatever reason. Maybe it's been hit by a car, maybe it was attacked by a predator but then got away but then died later on. You know, there are all sorts of reasons why, even just old age. And so animals have to be able to um, kind of take advantage of these serendipitous resources whenever and wherever they happen to occur. They also provide extremely abundant food once they're encountered on the scale of, I mean obviously like a dead mouse or dead bird is not going to be extremely useful, but the sorts of vultures that these guys were looking at, these guys can capitalize on things like sheep and cattle and if you're thinking about you know, the African vultures out on the savanna, they, there might be an elephant. So there are some really large carcasses that these guys can all descend upon and it, they'll feed you know, dozens and dozens of animals all at once. And so that's quite an unusual thing in terms of 
providing food for that many animals in one little space at one little period of time. And also, because of this, because there are lots of animals that are interested in that kind of normally unavailable resource, they can be quite ephemeral because there's going to be intense competition with others. And so you might have uh, 50 vultures that all descend upon this one carcass and so they devour it within hours. And the authors, in fact, here, when they left out carcasses, they found that they were all gone within one day. So the vultures and other animals that might come in as well can make extremely quick work of this. So once you get wind of and actually, in this case, that might be both literal and uh, metaphorical. Once you get wind of a carcass, you really may not have that long to actually use that information because by the time you get there, it might have already been eaten and might no longer be available to you. So this all makes the information use around locating and utilizing these resources actually quite an interesting thing to study because it's quite dynamic. And Although carcasses may remain undiscovered for hours or even days, usually, once they have been found, suddenly it's not just the, the initial finder that's there, it's a bunch of other animals that somehow key in on that as well and, and descend. And if you've ever been out on a safari, if you've been lucky enough to go to, to Africa, for example, you really do notice this, where you can be driving along through the savanna and maybe one day you kind of happen across a carcass and then the next day you go there and all of a sudden you know there are like 20 birds sitting in the tree just waiting waiting for a lion to come and rip open a carcass or a hyena to show up so that they can suddenly get in there and eat it as well and it is remarkable how very quickly these guys will find this stuff and so the thing with vultures is that you can have a vulture finding the carcass on its own but then it usually does seem like other vultures in the area are using that information. They see that first one drop out of the sky and go somewhere and they say, hey, that, that looks awfully interesting. What's going on there? And then they all kind of follow suit. And so even though it is quite likely that they are using this social information, that hasn't yet really definitively been shown for the animals in this particular study. And let's say that they are using that social information. What we don't know is exactly the way in which they're doing it. And that is what these guys were trying to figure out here, was how are they using this information to improve their success and synchronize their arrival. It could be uh, kind of inadvertent social information, which is likely the case. So these guys are changing their flight behavior in order to descend and go down to the carcass, and then the nearby birds are noticing this. And that is what the authors are calling this informational transmission network in the sky, where basically you have all these guys flying around, and as, as soon as one or two of them start to alter their behavior, suddenly the others do as well, and that message starts spreading across space, because they are able to see things at quite, quite a great distance. And so they're spreading that information about the food. Now the theoretical models that have um, been done in the past have relied on this idea called a vulture chain. And basically it's an assumption about the way in which different vultures in the sky are using this information about potential carrion sources. And this assumption has been used to explore the consequences of foraging behavior on all sorts of parameters. So things like population viability, the evolution of obligate scavenging, uh, the impact of trophic resource management on vulture populations. So thinking about if, if we clean up carcasses really quickly, how is that going to impact vultures? Or if we put uh, carcasses out for them, how will that impact them? But the reason that the authors wanted to engage in this study is that they felt that the vulture chain idea was something, you know, it's, it's a possible idea, but it's not a fact. And it's been used in the past as though it is a fact. And they want to potentially explore some alternatives and to see how useful this really is as something that you can apply actual data to. And so they wanted to kind of uh, look at these three hypotheses that are kind of competing as being the most likely. Now the first is the non-social hypothesis, which states that vultures only use personal information when they're foraging, and they're not using any other sort of social information to cue in on anything. And this is actually a hypothesis that's kind of a baseline part of the other two hypotheses as well, because uh, the other two do use social information, but what you have to remember is that you always have to have at least one bird to start off with that finds the carcass, and then the social thing could kick in afterwards, where the other birds that see that happen could then cue in in some way. So 
this either can be the only thing that happens, or it's the first step of these other two potential hypotheses that also involve social stuff. So the first of those is local enhancement, and it's also known as area copying. And in this hypothesis, you've got the idea that individuals are attracted to a site from a distance because they see conspecifics or other uh, birds of their type engaging in activity in that region. So in this case, basically, they'd be triggered to change their behavior because suddenly they see that some of the vultures around them have changed their flight and they're no longer spiraling around, they're no longer soaring up high in the air, they're suddenly dropping quickly and very directly and, and obviously going towards a specific destination. It's very conspicuous from high altitudes whenever someone is suddenly up in the, uh, the high bit of the sky and then just plummets out and goes to a certain place on the ground. And the vultures uh, would detect carcasses then by seeing an unoccupied carcass themselves or watching other vultures feeding on that carcass and then descending or seeing vultures descending in that vertical flight to a carcass. So there are three different things there really within that hypothesis that would explain how it is that vultures are finding the food. And then there's the final hypothesis which is the chain of vultures hypothesis which says that vultures at different distances from the carcass would follow each other's movements one after another. So you might have one that's kind of right above it that would go down and then someone else a bit farther away would see that and go down and then someone else even farther off will have seen that second vulture and then go down. So actually you can have one little activity in kind of the, the nexus area that would just have a huge physical uh, geographical impact because all this cascading uh, behavioral activity around it could spread for miles and miles and miles because vultures can see quite far. So if you are way far away from the carcass, you could still see the activity of other birds that are kind of watching others that are nearby. And so that can spread the information potentially over a much larger physical distance. So here you've got carrion discovered by seeing an unoccupied carcass as before, seeing other vultures feeding on the carcass, again, as before, or seeing vultures engaged in either direct or gradually descending flight, because you've got kind of the multiple different types of behavioral cues happening here. So that adds kind of one extra component on what this might actually look like out in the wild. So the aim here with this experiment was to test the power of these different hypotheses to explain the foraging behavior in one specific species, the griffin vulture in Spain. And uh, as I kind of suggested already, they've created individual based models. So they're thinking about, uh, they've got a bunch of individual little birds within a model and thinking about how would these little birds behave given these certain parameters. And they, um, they created different sub-models, so one for each of the different hypotheses that I just explained, and then they were able to include parameters that mimicked the behavior of these guys out in the wild. So thinking about actual vis visual acuity, how far can they be from each other and impact each other's behavior, what's their foraging flight speed, and also how density are both, how density, how tense are both the vultures and the carcasses in a particular known study area. So they could enter all these parameters into the computer to make sure that the model was functioning just like the animals themselves would out in the wild. And they could then compare their computer data to data actually collected out in the field. So just after the break, I will talk a little bit more about the specific methods and then start to think about what the study actually found. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Chris Isaac with Blue Spanish Sky. Now, on today's show, I am talking about a recent study looking at uh, vulture communication and actually social information use and how these guys can watch each other to figure out where there's food for them to eat. So just before the break, I was giving the background of the study, and now I want to think about some of the explicit methods that were used. So the empirical study here watching the actual vultures, not the theoretical study where they modeled them in the computer. The empirical study was done in the Ebro Valley of northeastern Spain. And this is home to one of the most important European populations of avian scavengers. So they fo focused on the griffin vulture, as I said, which has a breeding population of approximately 2,400 pairs within the study area, and also several hundred more immature birds. So there were 
thousands of birds here that they could potentially be on the lookout for. And they were monitoring the birds' use of adult sheep carcasses that they had placed out in the open in fields throughout the study. So th these were away from places where the birds were already aggregating so they could make sure that the carcasses weren't simply being found because the birds were roosting nearby or dropping down to drink water nearby or anything like that. They put them away from where the birds normally would spend time in large numbers so that really they were focusing on animals that happened to find the carcasses and then animals that were watching the birds who were doing that. And they uh, did this also in a way that they would then be able to actually know where those carcasses are because obviously if you are studying these things out in the field you're quite lucky to stumble upon a carcass and to stumble upon a carcass that a vulture had stumbled upon as well. It's you know, kind of a confluence of events that might not be too easy to achieve. So by putting these things out there experimentally they were able to make sure they knew where and when to be in order to look for the vultures. And this actually is kind of a logical thing for them to use, the sheep carcass, because there are sheep in the area and this is kind of a natural source of food for many of the vultures. They would eat sheep that had been put out to pasture and died for some reason or another. And the carcasses were watched until they were consumed, which usually was within one day of when they were located. The vultures were very good at what they did. Now in terms of the computer model, I'm not going to tell you anything that's like too scary and inaccessible, hopefully, but it is kind of interesting to think about how they build these things in reality. So they had uh, three different models. They had the non-social model and then the two social models in terms of how these birds might use the information. So they included uh, several different parameters that, you know, they, they program this in and then let the computer run so that it basically functions like a bunch of vultures in a habitat looking for carcasses. So they had some number of vultures, they told it, they started off and said you have this number of vultures, there's this number of carcasses, and they're going to be flying over kind of a gridded out space that's 100 by 100 kilometers. And each vulture would start as a searcher, so it's functioning like it's flying around looking for something. And then depending on which of the models they were testing, and also the animal's successes in finding carcasses, the vultures could then become uh, a follower, so they would see another vulture do something and then behave accordingly, or they would be a finder themselves, so they would come close enough to a carcass that it would trigger uh, their own kind of finding of it, and then they would be the, the first ones there, or and or they could be a feeder. So it might be the case that uh, you have been a searcher, you then find a carcass and you start feeding on it and then some other vulture locates the carcass because it sees you feeding on it. So there are all these different categories that things could be uh, and sometimes these happened in sequence. It wasn't just one or the other. Now each carcass started as unoccupied so it had no feeders but then obviously as the vultures found it, it could be reclassified uh, as occupied so as having a feeder. Now at the beginning of each model run searchers and unoccupied carcasses were distributed randomly throughout that 100 square kilometer habitat. So basically it would just kind of say, you know, on this grid there are going to be this number of vultures, this number of carcasses, and it would randomly generate some numbers in some lo locations and throw all those things onto the map. And it had nothing to do with anything. It was just completely random. And the model would then be run for some set amount of time. And every 10 seconds, there would be a shift in how things uh, were kind of situated. So there was, this is called a time step, and the time step was every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, a vulture would make a move, and it would just basically be flying over the habitat. So each 10 seconds, it goes some extra distance in some extra uh, direction. So you might go straight forward, you might go forward for a bit and then take a right or take a left, you might circle around. It's, again, it's going to be completely random with the exception of where they were able to enter in some parameters to try to make these behaviors as biologically lifelike and accurate as possible. And the things that they were able to include um, that made things kind of, you know, hopefully not just computer stilted and, and quite unlikely were things like uh, the speed at which the vultures were flying and also the degrees in which they were changing direction, and also the distance over which the birds were able to respond to the sight of a carcass. 
So all of this together kind of hopefully meant that the way in which these computerized birds were, were moving and utilizing the habitat and responding to each other were quite logical. And of course, once a finder reaches a carcass, it would then become a feeder, and once it became a feeder, it would stay put there for the rest of the simulation and not go back up into the air and fly around again. Now in the social models, you've got uh, the vulture's arrival at a carcass, meaning that suddenly that carcass is more visible to vultures, to other vultures still in the sky, at a greater distance. Under the local enhancement model, the searchers could detect the vertical sinking behaviors of the finders just before the finders got to the feeders. But under the chain of vulture submodels, the searchers could detect the finders and the followers at the same distance as each other, and then themselves become followers. So this is kind of increasing the area over which the vultures are able to respond to each other's use of this information that there is a carcass there. So the two detection distances in the models are the same, which means that the models would differ not in the distances over, over which information could be gathered, but in how the information could be used. So the chain of vultures is creating this much larger network, whereas the local enhancement one is kind of more restricted and more self-contained. And each of these models was run a thousand times apiece, and at the end they uh, collected information on the total number of vultures that had arrived at each carcass. And this is, again, something that they could then look out for in the field in order to compare the values. And they run it lots of different times because, you know, sometimes things might happen by chance, and so you want to generate a whole lot of repetitions of things in order to see how likely patterns are simply because they're happening by chance or because that actually is, uh, there's something in that pattern. There's, there's a logic to it, and so that's why it's coming up again and again. So they do a bunch of um, different repetitions and then kind of plot those out, and you can see where is the most common behavior. Do you have kind of one thing that's coming out again and again as being a really useful pattern? And by useful, what I really mean is something that is noticeable also out in the field. So they also, at the end of this, did something called an uncertainty analysis, where they knew that they had some information here that was incomplete or a bit uncertain in terms of the parameters that they included in the models. And so they wanted to basically see how robust these things were. So they kind of tweaked values here and there by putting in random parameters rather than those biologically accurate ones in order to see how, how then would the resulting models differ from what they ran. So they ran these kind of random analyses another thousand times so they could compare the two sets of things. So what were the results of all these things? Well, the three submodels, the three different hypotheses that they had, they differed extremely in terms of the spatial, be uh, spatial behavior, sorry I can't talk, of the vultures. So in particular, what they noticed were differences at which the vultures could see um, the carcasses, like the, the spatial distance over which they could see these carcasses, and the way in which the feeders were distributed across those carcasses at the end of the experiment. And they produced a really nice figure here where they could kind of graphically visualize the way that things ended up at the end of each 1,000 runs for each of these models. And with the non-social model, they've got kind of this just gray square with a few black dots here and there, where each black dot represents the vulture that had kind of found the carcass. But with the local enhancement model, you've got this, again, you've got the gray square with the black dots, but then there are all these little lines, kind of little fuzzy lines outside of the black dot. And each of the fuzzy lines indicates all the different vultures within that one little tiny spot that had been sucked into that carcass because they had seen some sort of information that told them that there was a carcass there, and so they, they circled into it. But it's clearly just a little kind of circle of activity around each carcass, and it's very contained within space. But then in the chain of vulture model, you can see where each of the little black carcass dots has all these long lines stretching across the habitat, where you can see that vultures from really far away, from clear across the other side of the 100 by 100 kilometer grid, they've flown all the way in to a certain spot. And in fact, there's one carcass in particular that seems to have gotten tons of attention because obviously there were just lots of birds that were beginning to cue in on it and go to it. And so you've got all these lines of vulture flight 
going down to that one single carcass and lots of other carcasses that actually remain completely untouched. So when you just look at this visual, it's extremely different the way in which these models would predict that the birds would act. And they found uh, the highest dispersion values in the chain of vulture submodel, where you've got a small number of carcasses, each with a large number of feeders. They also found that the minimum, median, mean, and maximum number of feeders per carcass in each simulation differed between the submodel. So basically, what that means is that with each of the different hypotheses, you would ex expect extremely different numbers of vultures to arrive at the bodies by the end. So in the non-social submodel, they found that no carcass had more than 58 feeders, so each one is going to be quite distinct and kind of found only by a few birds. In local enhancement, they had gatherings of up to 256 at some of the carcasses. And in the chain of vultures, at that one that I mentioned that had tons of activity, they found almost 2,300 birds could have seen this and all descended upon it at once, which of course would not be very good in the wild because it's quite unlikely that you would even get the tiniest mouthful if you arrived at that carcass. So what did all of those kind of model results look like relative to the empirical data? Well, the frequency distribution of the number of feeders per carcass differed between the real and the simulated carcasses under the non-social and chains of vultures submodels, but they were quite similar to the local enhancement hypotheses. So again, this frequency distribution, I mentioned how they did things a thousand times in the computer, and they kind of plotted that out to see where things were happening by chance and where things were happening over and over and over again, and suggesting that that's a real pattern. So that's what a frequency distribution is, seeing kind of across the range of values that you measured, where some are happening a lot and where some aren't happening all that much at all. So what they found is that the pattern that was in the wild was quite similar to that local enhancement hypothesis in particular. Now all three of the submodels did kind of underestimate the minimum number of vultures that would be found on experimental carcasses. And in particular, uh, the chain of vultures submodel was quite bad. So they tended to think um, that you know, 58 feeders was the lowest number that they got in the models, and that was quite a bit higher than they were actually seeing in the wild. In the wild, there might be carcasses with only one or two, or certainly many fewer than 58 feeders. The median also slightly overestimated, uh, was slightly overestimated by the local enhancement submodel, but very underestimated by the other two submodels. So the best fit there, again, was the local enhancement, even though it wasn't, you know, kind of 100% on. So overall, this was the submodel that kind of outperformed the other two in terms of the mean and the maximum number of feeders, and there was a pretty good fit between the simulated values and the empirical values, what they were actually seeing out in the field. And the uncertainty analysis was also quite encouraging, which suggested that the computer models that they put together actually were quite useful uh, and pretty robust and were pretty uh, good at kind of basically giving you an idea of how animals should behave out in the wild assuming um, these kind of parameters are more or less correct. Welcome back to the Wild Side. This is your host Caitlin Kite and that was Jenny Lewis and the Watson Twins with The Changing Sky. Now just before the break I was talking about the results of a study that looked at vulture feeding behavior and how other vultures can cue in on each other in order to figure out where a carcass is. And the researchers here have done some empirical models and they've done some, they've done some computer models and then they've compared those to see uh, which computer model was the best fit for what was actually happening out in the wild. And what they found was that it is most likely that the birds are using social information, so they are cueing in on each other in order to find carcasses out in the wild. And in fact, when they do this, it seems to be um, a, a way in which they're kind of locally cueing in on each other, but not spreading this information in huge networks across the sky, as has previously been assumed. So it's kind of a, a small tightly knit group of birds that are kind of near to each other that are doing this and not basically the whole flock that's in an entire region. And this is quite an interesting thing to know because it does impact how we might expect to find vultures distributed across the habitat, where we might find them both up in the air and also down on the ground. And it's quite interesting because this sort of social information use 
is also found in other species as well. And so we can, we can see an example here and how it impacts how these birds act and then see how maybe that might apply to other animals or in, in fact other species in general elsewhere. Now, another quite interesting thing here is that in the past, people have assumed that the chain of vultures hypothesis, where you've got this really large informational cascade over quite a large area, this has been assumed in the past in order, in order to explain certain other things and to be used in other models as well. And now we see that actually this is probably not what's happening, at least in this particular species. And that means that maybe we need to go back and rethink some of those previous models. They do recognize that all of their submodels kind of underestimated the minimum number of feeders per carcass. And clearly they think that there's some other factor or group of factors that needs to be considered and corrected in order to make their models more accurate, in order to figure out exactly what is happening in the wild. Now, the model structure might be off a little bit, uh, which is not suggested by the robustness analyses. So this suggests that maybe it's in fact the biological parameters that are a bit off rather than the computer system. So maybe they're missing some critical behaviors. For example, maybe the birds need to achieve some sort of a quorum or a critical mass where you've got, um, you need to have a certain number of birds before you decide to go into the carcass. And maybe if they are in a habitat where it's particularly unsafe, they don't really feel comfortable going down until there are five, six, seven, a dozen other birds around so that they know they've got strength in numbers or lots of eyes open to look out for predators. It's also the case that the group nature of uh, birds in general and vultures specifically, so for example the fact that they do forage together often or that they will communally roost, maybe this affects the way in which they are distributed throughout the habitat. So. Some of them, rather than being completely randomly distributed throughout an area, they might actually spend time near each other, which is not really taken care of and taken consideration of in these particular models. So maybe you will have some clumped spatial distribution to start off with, even if it's not all of the birds in one space. Uh, it, you know, there might be a few over here and then a few over there, and so actually you've just got a, a small number of little groups rather than completely random distribution. It's also interesting to consider why they overestimated the number of vultures that arrived at uh, the simulated carcasses under the chain of vultures submodel. So why do they have 2,300 vultures ending up at that one carcass, something that you probably never see out in the wild? And uh, it might be that some birds are able to evaluate whether certain carcasses are oversubscribed. So they do descend on a place because it they can see the activity and it looks interesting, but maybe once they see a certain number of birds on the ground, they decide to pass that area up because they know it's just completely useless to go down there because they're not going to be able to get in and get any food. Now, the authors do feel that the local enhancement strategy probably is more adaptive for a couple of different reasons. So they do think that the computer model that has been best supported by the empirical evidence does make sense, not just because it happens to have good numbers that match up, but also because if you think about it kind of intuitively, it does follow. So for example, vultures would need to be able to differentiate between descending to eat and descending to roost or get water or do some other activity. And this is the thing that you could do in kind of that small spatial area, but maybe wouldn't be able to do quite so well on that larger area, the chain of vultures kind of scale of things. Also, they feel that vultures should be cautious to avoid um, kind of making the wrong decision and also wasting their flying time. And so it kind of makes sense that they, they would be kind of watching each other but not necessarily um, just going in and I was going to say going in for the kill, but that obviously is, is quite a bad phrase to use in this context. Uh, they, they wouldn't want to commit themselves prematurely or in inappropriate situations. And they do realize also that, in general, even if information is reliable, so even if these vultures do use whichever of these kind of social networks or maybe some other one that's not studied here, they do have to take into account the fact that there might be um, unreliability of the data. So there might be time and space, space issues such that the value of the information decreases over time or decreases over different spatial areas because the carcasses would be rapidly depleted. So the birds would have to kind of make some sort of 
uh, adjustment for this and, and take this into consideration when they're deciding whether or not to actually descend when they're flying around. So overall, thinking about the kind of conclusions of this study, clearly it suggests that researchers have been wrong all along to assume the chain of vultures hypothesis when they're thinking about how these birds are foraging for their carcasses. And this is actually really important for understanding the movements of vultures through anthropogenic areas in particular. So when we're thinking about how the birds might fly through wind farms, for example, where they could be subjected to um, being hurt by the turbines, solar energy farms where we know that sometimes birds can be caught in that heat and actually burned and injured, near power lines where they can get caught, near airports where they can get hit by planes. It's quite important for thinking about how they're going to be moving and where and when through these sorts of habitats. So we can remodel that in order to get an idea of where, where the birds will be and how to make them safer and make us safer. It's also important when thinking about vulture conservation and the availability or not of potential prey items, also how they use the habitat, the minimum viable population numbers in case they need a certain number of birds that they can queue off of in order to effectively feed. So things like that that we need to know in order to manage for them and make their populations healthy. And we also know that additional computer models can be used to investigate the potential impacts of other sorts of scenarios on vulture populations. So we can kind of model these uh, potential factors that we know could affect them and throw those into the mix and see how they might change this sort of behavior. Or maybe they don't change it at all, and that, that would be also quite valuable information. So hopefully you now are convinced. I have done quite a few modeling papers lately. Hopefully it's not overwhelming. And actually you think, I do understand this a bit better, and I can see why this modeling stuff would be useful, because it actually can be applied to things that are happening in the real world. Um, and if you're not, then I guess I'm just going to have to keep doing more and more numbers until you are finally convinced. But for now, that is it for me, and I will leave you with Katie B. singing Sky is the Limit. Talk to you next week.